Good morning, everyone. My name is Megan Moore. I am co-founder of the Center for Functional Nutrition, and uh, we welcome you to our Sunday morning coffee house. We're looking forward to today's presentation, and um, there are no announcements. And Russell, I will hand the call. Oh, all our main announcement, I guess, is, is that Brian Mariani will not be with us this morning. So. Russell and I are hosting, and Russell will introduce our guest today. Russell? Thank you, Megan. Good morning, everybody. Um, I thought that uh, many times coming to the coffee house, I don't read the email, which contains the bio explaining a little bit about the person who is presenting that Sunday morning. But this Sunday morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Dee and when I looked at you know, her bio that went out last week, I thought, you know, it's perfect. So I'm just going to read it because I know other people haven't read it. And it's very interesting and uh, very succinct. So this Sunday, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dee Matchett back to our coffee house, an osteogenic technician. Dee completed her training in American Bone Health to prepare herself for opening an osteostrong franchise. OsteoStrong Farragut has been in operation since January of 2017. She's currently enrolled at the Carlton, in, uh, Calton Institute of Lifestyle Medicine to obtain her certification as a micronutrient specialist so that she will be better able to help people deal with the micronutrient deficiencies that have led to bone loss. A native of Tennessee, Dee has lived all over the USA and pursued many interests, including organic gardening, herbology, homeopathy, midwifery, music composition, and language arts. Alternative health care has always been a focus of her attention. She holds a bachelor's degree in foreign language and a master's of education. She's certified by the American Bone Health Institute as a peer educator. And my favorite part, Dee called her father the absent-minded professor. Dee's father designed the guidance ring for the Saturn V rocket that successfully went to the moon and back, and once told her, quote, school doesn't end when you graduate. Never stop learning, end quote. And that advice has stuck with her. She's always seeking to know more about whatever interest has caught her attention or whatever challenge she may be facing. And that is definitely the theme for all of us here at the coffee house and all of us uh, at the Center for Functional Nutrition and the greater community, that we all continue to learn, especially about those things that nourish us be best, help us optimize our uh, mission and goals and vision in life. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dee Matchett. And Dee, if you'll just unmute yourself, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, it is a pleasure to be here today and to share with everybody. So I just love all the smiling faces. Hi, Janet. We didn't get to say hi a while ago. You came on. So some of you I know, which is really exciting. Um, I have a PowerPoint to share. So uh, we're going to talk about um, some essential nutrients for bone density. So let me go ahead and pop that up on the screen. There we go. So I can still see you guys on the side, which is great. Um, so I have actually completed my CMS and am now doing an internship with the Carlton Institute of Lifestyle Medicine. So um, just have really spent quite a bit of time um, learning about bone health and wanted to share some things with you today. We've got a lot to cover. So I'm trying to get this to go to the next slide. How do I do that? Oh, there we go. I guess do this way. Okay, got it. So last time I was on in November, um, we talked about what osteogenic loading is. And so you can go, there's a link here, and I'm sure this will be um, on the Coffee House um, YouTube, and you can go back and read and look through that um, PowerPoint. But just in essence, what we're doing is creating fluid shear stress by moving the interstitial fluid in the bone and if you wanna find out how that happens, you can go look at that other um, presentation. Uh, but in five seconds, you can trigger this signaling pathway that promotes osteogenic differentiation that lasts for about a week. Um, 
So the body is still looking for the nutrients. We can signal the body to begin that pathway, but it is still looking for nutrients along the way. Yeah, so where are the needed nutrients to build bone? Well, what we often find is that there's a lack of vitamin D and vitamin K, and those are the most common ones. There are others. Um, I know we hear a lot of emphasis on calcium, but most people are not deficient in calcium. And if you're taking uh, what's in a general multivitamin, it's usually calcium carbonate, which is basically rock, and your body doesn't know what to do with it, and it gets deposited in places you don't really want it. But we know that vitamin D, many people are deficient in. Overall in the United States, 42%. Um, now, they actually have not updated this apparently because I can't find, even, even things that are like 2020, they're referencing this study done in 2011. So apparently they haven't updated this information in over 10 years. <laughs> but um, I would not think that these percentages are any better. If anything, there might be worse. So overall, 42% of people are deficient, 74% of the elderly, 82% of people with dark skin. You can get vitamin D from your diet, um, and they're what we call the rich foods, um, the fatty things, cod and tuna and salmon and egg yolks and sardines, those kinds of things. Mushrooms do absorb them from sunlight, but you have to eat like tons of mushrooms to get enough but it is another good, another possible source for you. So I wanna talk a little bit about vitamin D synthesis um, because we also get vitamin D from the sun, which is probably how our body's intended to do this primarily. So that vitamin D is called um, uh, colocalciferol. It is synthesized by the skin into that vitamin D3 form, which is what the body needs in order to utilize the vitamin D. And then it goes into the liver and it um, goes through a hydroxylation process and then through the kidneys. Plants do this a little differently. They photochemically synthesize that in the plants. And so if you're eating things that have done that, you know, you're getting it from those sources as well. But they end up doing the same thing going through the liver and into the kidney for this hydroxylation process. So when you do a vitamin, and it's very difficult to get sufficient vitamin D in your diet. And the where we are on the planet, we're not getting a lot of uh, sunlight most of the year to get sufficient uh, vitamin D just from the sun. If you're going to supplement, most people recommend the vitamin D3 because the vitamin D2 is less potent, has a shorter duration of action, the vitamin D, you get higher circulating levels in your bloodstream and it's sustained for longer. So I've got references on all of these slides where you can go back and, and look at the um, research data. So I get this question all the time, how much vitamin D should I take? And it's really not the best question. The better one is what serum level of vitamin D do I need in my blood in order to build bone? Um, it's not hard to run a vitamin D test, very commonly run in blood work. So your body converts that vitamin D and then they can measure it as calcidiol in the body or what they call 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So that test monitors your vitamin D levels. There is hard to say what an exact optimum is for people because it varies, it can vary by the stage of life you're in, your age, your race and ethnicity, how much sunlight, you know, it just varies. So here's what, let's see, yes. Here's what we do know. The range on the test is like from 30 to 100 um, molecules. So you're deficient if you're less than 30, potentially deficient between 30 and 50. Normal levels, somewhere between 50 and 125 higher than 125, and I've even read as much as 150, um, becomes toxic. So if we're looking at that in terms of vitamin D, it looks like this. So remember the range is 30 to 100 on the test, but that, and so it doesn't flag. Like if you're at 32, it doesn't flag as being low vitamin D because that's the parameters. So your physician often, doesn't recognize that you have a vitamin D deficiency, okay? But if you're below 50, that's inadequate for bone health. 
Optimal for like maintaining bone health, 50 to 70. But a therapeutic level that would be needed if you actually have osteoporosis and needed to you know, rebuild bone is that 70 to 100 range. And then they don't like to see you go over 100 because they don't want you to get into that toxic range, but you can actually go over 100 and not be toxic for a while. So most people, it just depends on where your level is as to where you need to fall in this and what you're trying to, if you're at osteoporosis already, you know, where you need to go in order to build bone. 50% um, of women un undergoing treatment for osteoporosis have an inadequate vitamin D level. So it's really quite common to have this deficiency if you have bone loss. Yeah, so I have people come in all the time and I ask them, what's your vitamin D level? Oh, well, it's normal. Well, what does your blood work say? And I say, well, I don't know, but I'll bring it next time. They bring me their blood work and they're at, you know, 31 or 33 or 39. So, but their doctor has never mentioned to them that they have low vitamin D levels because it falls in that parameter. So you do have to be careful supplementing with vitamin D because those levels can change rather quickly when you begin to supplement. So you need to continue monitoring those vitamin D levels until you get to that desired place for you. So I just wanted to mention what the symptoms of uh, vitamin D toxicity are, because it creates what we call hypercalcemia and you get too much calcium in the blood. And then you get nausea and vomiting and weakness and frequent urination. Most people, all you gotta do is back off, right? <laughs> you go, oh, I've got too much and you back off. However, if it's unrecognized and continues on, it can do damage to the kidneys. And I do know a lady, um, she was vitamin D deficient. Her doctor recognized it, put her on a therapeutic dose, but nobody ever followed up with it. So she wound up taking all this vitamin D because she thought she was supposed to, began to have the symptoms and they, she wasn't going to the same doctor. So they didn't check the vitamin D and they diagnosed her with other, in other words, they're trying to treat it as something different, right? <laughs> yeah, and then it wound up damaging her kidneys. So you do have to be careful. You do have to monitor it in your blood. And then we're gonna talk about K2. Um, this is not K1 and we'll explain the difference, but K2 is a different vitamin than K1. And the active form your body uses is called MK7. It's hard to get in our diets because you can see the things here are fermented foods, um, certain cheeses, Gouda and natto, and, and um, natto is the soy, fermented soy you'll see there on the screen. So here's what vitamin K2 does. It stimulates the carboxylation of osteocalcin to bind calcium to the bone. So you can see in this little process, the vitamin K2 that you eat becomes MK7 in the body by going through this little process. And then the calcium in the blood can attach to that. And after it attaches, then it lays it down into the bone. So you can take tons of calcium, which is what they're, you know, most physicians are telling people with osteoporosis will take more calcium. You can take tons of calcium, but if the K2 isn't sufficient, it's not connecting it's not joining to in order to get into the bone. I call it the cement. K2 is the cement that takes the calcium and cements it down into the bone. So I wanna explain a little bit about the difference between K1 and K2. Um, K1 is the K that we always hear about that is for blood clotting. 90% uh, of the K in our Western diet is K1. So it comes from green leafy vegetables. It's in your multivitamin. Um, the RDA is 121 micrograms for men and 90 micrograms for women. That RDI is based on the need for coagulation. Okay, so that's how they determine that. There is no determination for the K2. Toxicity is rare for both. The primary action of K1 is traveling to the liver where it forms clotting proteins and it can interfere with if you're on an anticoagulant. So we're gonna compare that to the K2. So you eat K2, it is known as MK, whatever, there's several different numbers and variants that it becomes. Um, so one of them is MK4, we'll talk about that also. 
So its primary job is to direct the calcium out of the blood, into the bones, out of your soft tissues, into the bones to prevent calcifications. So one mistake people make is by taking tons of calcium and usually it's one of those forms that are not well absorbed and the body's going, what am I going to do with this? It winds up putting it in the bloodstream, in the heart, kidney stones, wherever it can find a place to deposit. Um, so there are better forms of calcium. That's a whole nother topic we'll go to, but most people are not deficient in calcium. But there are not many sources of K2 in our modern Western diet. And you'll understand why, because the sources are primarily unpasteurized milk products. Um, and most everything now is, is pasteurized. You can get it from fermented foods. And I'm talking about naturally fermented, not your sauerkraut that's already been pasteurized. So MK4 is in Gouda and Brie and MK7 is in natto and edam. So these are cheeses, except for the natto is not, but the gouda and the brie and the edam are. But they're not things that people generally keep in their diet. Also, you can get it from grass-fed meat, grass-fed dairy, but not many people are eating grass-fed products. So generally, people are deficient in K2. Um, it is usually not in your multivitamin because it's a whole lot cheaper to do K1 than K2. So it's not in your multivitamin most of the time. Again, toxicity is rare. Its primary action is to travel to the bone and form those osteocalcin proteins. There is not a lot of research on K2. And so there is some concern about it also being a coagulant because it does have some of those properties. So we don't have a really enough information to say, does it interfere with an anticoagulant that you might be on? Um, but this was a study you'll see done in 2001 that you can reference. He put elderly people on vitamin K that had osteoporosis and they did not have any clotting effect. Um, but that was just this one study. So there's really kind of like, it's still out there. We don't know as, as much as we would like to know about that. So if you're going to take a K2 and you're on an anticoagulant, I would talk with your care provider and let them know that so that they can adjust medication if they need to. Yeah, so our body does convert some K1 to K2, but we're not very efficient at that. Animals are, but we're just not. So it probably is better to do a supplement with that. So we're gonna talk about supplement forms. Um, MK4 is always a synthetic. There's, they don't have any natural MK4s on the market. So it is poorly absorbed. It has a short half-life, so you have to take it frequently throughout the day. You have to take it in higher doses. Most of the um, research was done on MK4 because it was all they had available at the time. Some of the newer research is done with MK7. So MK7, you can get natural from natto, which is a fermented soy. It's um, not just like tofu or something. It's a special bacteria that they use to ferment it that creates more MK7. There is also synthetic forms. It has a longer half-life, so it doesn't require as high a dosage. You only have to take it like once a day. So that is the recommendation uh, from the Carlson Institute of uh, Naturopathic Medicine is to take this natural form of MK7. And so here's just a little bit of some brief things from some of the early research. They found that K2, um, was effective at new bone healing and at fracture prevention for osteoporosis. That was in 2000. This is the one I wanna take a look at here. So the, this was a two year study. They follow people's lumbar uh, bone density and they had people in four different groups. One was just taking calcium. They actually had a reduction in bone mass. There was one group taking just vitamin D3. They had a slight increase one group taking just K2, they had um, well, a little less than 1%, but at least we're showing some progress here. And then they had the group that was taking both vitamin K2 and D3 and got a 1.35% increase. So that was, I just wanted you to notice that, it, that that combination worked better. And they also, another study found that bisphosphonate, which is a group of drugs that they use um, to treat, um, osteoporosis were more effective when they were combined with the K2. So that's the early research with MK4. This is some research with MK7. Um, 
so they also found that this combination, they, they used calcium and vitamin D and vitamin K together and um, found that it was um, supported bone health better. That was in 2019. And this one in 2020 found that the NK7 had the highest bioavailability and the most significant effect on osteocalcin carboxylation. That's that joining of the K2 with the calcium. So, and here's what's really nice. K1 and MK4 at their current RDIs are not sufficient to activate that osteocalcin to get that joining of the calcium and um, the vitamin and um, into the bone. So nice news that we want to know. And I wanna just explain how I've done this with my own body. Uh, so this is a little chart I made up. So in 2016, my vitamin D level was at 39.4, which I had, you know, was experienced this bone loss. So I began supplementing. Two years later, I'd only gotten it up to 40.1, which is really like nothing, right? So I started seeing this holistic nurse practitioner. We were working on this thing. We switched and tried to find what um, supplement was working best for me. So here we um, got it up to 46.9. I switched to a topical and it went way back down again. And then I did this little dissolve tablet that you just put under your tongue and it dissolves. And look at the difference. It popped up from 39 to 99 in just nine weeks time. So I actually started skipping it one day a week because I didn't want to get too high and I switched. Um, yes. Yeah, so anyhow, I got up to 99 and then I was, so I was a little leery of that too. So I went back to two days. I skipped it and it went down to 82.7. So, okay. At that point, so we're just trying to play with it and see what, how much I had to take in order to maintain the, the right um, amount in my bloodstream. So, then I read in the Call to Nutrition, he suggested taking vitamin D3 separately from your K2 because they're both fat soluble and will compete for absorption. So I did that in only about a month because it was actually not until the first part of January that I actually began taking, doing them separately. It jumped from 82 to 123. That was just like amazing in that short period of time that it would jump almost 40 points in only three to four weeks. So I was just amazed by that. And so now I tell people, take them separately because they do um, counteract one another. They do fight for absorption together. So I've reduced my dosage again. Um, I'm down to 112 and I'm trying to you know, get that balanced out too, but I'm finding that it's much more effective to take it separately than it is to take them at the same time. Although most vitamins, you'll find them together if they're going to do it. So why does all this matter? because even taking the vitamin K2 and D3, they only saw 1.35% increase in bone mass density, which is not a whole lot. At OsteoStrong, we're averaging 7.7% increase just doing osteogenic loading alone. So I got to thinking about, well, they were not separating their K2 from their D3, so they're not optimizing those vitamin D levels. And most people do fine with just osteogenic loading, but some people don't. And we have to start looking for that missing factor because we're always trying to find optimal results for them. So this is why I've pursued this because um, these are the most common deficiencies are D3 and the K2. Yeah, so if you're interested in, in the area, you can come to OsteoStrong Farragut. We do two complimentary sessions. And if you'll say that you found out about it here, I will give you a $25 coupon you can use at OsteoStrong. And that should be it at my time. Did I do good? <laughs> I was trying to get it all in there quickly. So That's great, Dee. Awesome. Um, and now we can yeah. just have questions. We Beautiful. So um, if people have questions, wave your hand, and then I will call it. Carol Montgomery, you can go first. Unmute Ooh. yourself. I've, I've unmuted myself, I think. Yes. Yeah. So D, um, is K2 found in free range chicken? Uh, yeah, yeah. So if it's grass fed, it's because they're getting the, anything grass fed, they're getting it out of the green, they're getting it out of the plant. And the sun has, you know, created that it's gone through that photosynthesis process. So it's in the plant. 
The problem is that so many of our meats are now grain fed rather than grass fed. So yes, you wanna look for grass fed. Great question, thank you, Carol. Janet Atkins. Good morning, Dee. Um, so I already take um, D3. I've been, I got up and was looking at my supplements. I already take a multi. Uh, I probably need to come talk to you about all of this. But do you, you take your supplements? Um, can you give us a link of, to where you get them? If we're interested in doing this. So um, just, yeah, the sublingual that I'm using right now is from Superior Source. Okay. Do you have an affiliate link so that we can give you some money back? That I don't. I mean, I'm not okay. selling those. They're, they're, I'm just, you find them online. Okay. And they're both sublingual, both the D3 and the K? D3 and the K2, you can find both of them from that company as a sublingual. Okay. You can find them in various amounts, okay? And so uh, you're, you're going to have to do that blood work to find out how much you need. So that was going to be question number two. Uh, other than going to our doctor, is there anywhere we can get blood tests? Um, you're going to have to find a, a holistic practitioner that's willing to run it frequently. Like I am having okay. mine done every eight weeks, which is generally they do it once a year and you're once a year and yeah. blood work, okay? Yeah. Which if you're playing with the supplementation, you need to know sooner than that, you know, where you are with it, okay? Okay. Um, so, but okay. there are nurse practitioners out there that are more health oriented. Uh, that will okay. help you with it. I've got several I can refer to you. Okay, that uh, that would be good. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Janet. Um, any other questions from anyone? Um, so D, I have a question, and that is, you know, simply, obviously, the presentation focused on what we can do, what we can add, what supplements to take to help with bone, uh, regaining bone health. Could you speak briefly on the things that people should be aware of that are contributing to the bone loss that they could correct, eat less of, drink less of, you know, some of the things that cause that over acidity and bone loss? Right. So, you know, typical American diet, people are eating at McDonald's and drinking Coca-Cola's. All of these things are very acidic, okay? And when you create an acidic environment in the body, it is going to go to the bone where all the alkaline minerals are, your magnesium and your calcium and phosphorus and sodium. Sodium. Yeah, they're, they're stored there in the bone, okay? So, that's, they're like a warehouse. In fact, like 90% of your calcium is in your bone and your body will just then take what it needs to balance things out in the bloodstream. It has to maintain a certain pH in the bloodstream. It, if your blood goes too alkaline or too acid, either way, it creates a problem. So your body's always adjusting that. It's very good at doing that. If it didn't, we'd all be dead, okay? <laughs> but it's going to go to the bone to find those alkaline minerals when it needs it. If you're eating a highly acidic diet, it's going to have to go rob the bone more and more frequently to work that out, to balance, to keep things in balance. It does this to keep you from dying, okay? Because that's what the body's supposed to do. So, but if you're eating a highly acidic diet, it's got to rob those bones very frequently. So then you get bone loss. So yes, yeah. so what are the highest Thanks. foods? You know, meat is very acidic, okay? So if you're gonna eat, if you're eating meat, you need to balance that out with more alkaline foods along with it. Your vegetables and things, those are very alkaline. Some fruits are alkaline, some fruits are acidic. You just need to look at a, this is another teaching that I also do um, that I have a PowerPoint on. <laughs> so, you know, and we talk about and, and how to get the most minerals out of your foods. Um, you get more vitamins out of raw, but you get more minerals out of cooked. So you have to have a little bit of both. Yeah, that's a great explanation, Dee. Thanks so much. And you were just referencing when you say, when you're talking about blood, alkaline acid, the body's constantly balancing that, the body's constantly protecting us. This is the first principle in functional medicine, that the body is constantly healing itself. The body is constantly protecting us. 
Many of us know that principle as homeostasis. Yes. The body is constantly creating balance, maintaining balance, trying to restore balance. The problem, of course, is most of us were not given an owner's manual. So what you've presented this morning, and we're very grateful, is part of that owner's manual related to how we can uh, maintain our bone health, regain our bone health, and prevent the loss of, uh, uh, of bone density, yes. prevent. Tell me all uh, about that homeostasis. In the bloodstream, it's about keeping this certain balance, certain pH. In the bone, it's about keeping things in balance. There's osteoclasts that tear the bone down, but what it's, it's a good thing. It's removing old bone that's more brittle, okay? And then new bones coming in through osteoblasts. When that gets out of balance, we don't have that homeostasis, then we get bone loss, okay? So eating these acidic foods are part of that because then you're going to upset this balance. What medications do is stop the osteoclasts that take the old bone away. They do not necessarily build new bone. There are a few that do, but they're, that's a whole different topic. Uh, most of what they're going to provide for you is a bisphosphonate that interferes with that balancing process, okay? So what we need to do is bring it back into balance, not stick a chemical in there that's interfering with it. Beautiful. I also, we're gonna to have to wrap it up now, Dee, but thank you very, very much. I also thought one of the most important points you made was that most people do not have calcium deficiencies. That calcium is literally one of the most abundantly occurring minerals in the normal food supply. Right. And that calcium supplements are often calcium carbonate which the body can't really deal with, it ends up storing it. You mentioned kidney stones. And so there's all kinds of problems that come from uh, really inferior quality calcium supplements. So yeah. again, thank you so much. It was a beautiful presentation. It was very helpful, very insightful. And uh, we thank you again for sharing with us your, your great information and, and knowledge. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, Megan, I just have, have one. Yeah, we have uh, Carol Patty is wondering if we always post our presentations to YouTube, but Carol is wondering if she could just have your um, slides separately. Is it possible for you to email your slides to Brian or myself? Or is it yeah, um, yeah. something you can do? Actually, this, this particular presentation, the slide um, is it's small enough? Yes, it will send through email. Sometimes they're too large to send through email, but I've done it to my this one. I know it will work. So yeah, I can do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. All right, everybody. Well, thanks so much. We do have a good news today, and uh, I'm going to cue it up here if I can. Uh, if everybody could mute. Um, let's see. Back in the fall, we shared this um, good news uh, piece. It's called the Keep Going On song by Abigail and Sean Bengson. And it, this literally first debuted in October of 2020, so not that long ago. I think I first saw it around November of 2020 when COVID fatigue was beginning to set in. So I still, uh, almost a whole year later, this for me and many of us uh, tends to be one of the, the most um, helpful and celebratory COVID songs to have come out of the pandemic. So uh, one thing I noticed, I watched this this morning, listened to it this morning, uh, it's great education of how to do Zoom. If you watch Abigail, during the whole process where she's singing, she's connecting directly. She's, she's learned to you know, speak directly into that microphone, look into that camera. So anyway, here we go, the Bengsons. This is the keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on, keep going on song. This is a keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on, keep going on song. This is a keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on, keep 
Well, there you have it. Uh, I love all of that song, but I love particularly where she says, let's create the world that we are imagining. Wow. And know that that is the purpose of this coffee house, to come together and to hear from these wonderful presenters representing the full range of health and healing. Thank you again, Dee, for a wonderful job this morning. And let's go out into the world and better people's lives and to be a force for good in the world. Amen. Thanks so much, everybody. You. See you next Sunday. Have a Bye. great week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us always. Yeah. Thank you.